people achieve exceptional success while others, well, frankly, don't. Uh, this woman studies the most successful people on the planet, winners like Nobel laureates, astronauts, Olympic champions, entrepreneurs. She wants to know what they do when the world isn't watching, what truly makes them elite. How do they deal with adversity and with failure? A lifetime of curiosity and research has made her one of the world's foremost authorities on developing the mindset and skill set for peak performance, as well as made her a highly sought after mentor and coach. Please welcome Ruth Gauthier. Ruth? Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, greetings from New York. I am so excited to share with everyone my obsession with success. And it really has become a long, long journey from what started with a doctoral dissertation and has led over the years to just seeing where it grows and reverse engineering the process. So I am really here to talk about what it takes to become a high achiever. And a lot of these lessons are those that I write about and talk about frequently, both in academic journals, lay journals, such as Forbes, as well as my upcoming book, The Success Factor. My background is in adult learning, and I fully recognize that not everyone can process and regurgitate the information or ask the questions on command. So I have put a lot of my contact information up here so that if anyone has questions or comments or thoughts later on, by all means, reach out to me and we can definitely take that conversation um, after the presentation, whenever, whenever you're ready. So my obsession with success and extreme high achievers I have been surrounded by high achievers my entire life because of the work I did for over 22 years. I ran a combined MD PhD program. And every time I would sit in the faculty cafe, there'd be a few Nobel laureates sitting next to me. And I realized they're just regular people. And when I was older in life at the age of 43, I am older than I look, I decided to go back to school and really find out about what it what it takes to become the most successful physician scientists of our generation. So I interviewed many Nobel laureates and the former Surgeon General and NIH Institute directors. And I finished that degree and thought I was done with research, but I just became more and more excited about it because I realized that the Nobel laureates and the, the most successful physician scientists had four things that they all did in common. And I was curious if those four elements would carry to other industries as well. So that led me to research uh, astronauts and Olympic champions and Fortune 500 CEOs and senior ranking government officials and people of that caliber. And guess what? Those four elements that I found in the Nobel laureates were the same four elements I found in Olympic champions and astronauts and, 400, and Fortune 500 CEOs, which means this is something that can be learned. This is a learned skill. So I reverse engineered the path to success, talking about those four elements and really teaching people how they can implement those four elements. And I try to give a lot of options because one of the things I recognize from the adult learning background is what works for me may not work for you. And adults, we like choices. So I give people a lot of choices usually when we break this down. But today I'll give an overview as to what those four elements are. But I want to tell you this one caveat. You cannot pick and choose which of the four you're going to do. You must do all four and you must do all four simultaneously. So here we go. The first one is they have found their intrinsic motivation. They have found what they love to do. They would do it for free if they could. And they sort of kind of are, right? An astronaut is a government worker. They are not doing it for the salary. Olympians, until they win that gold medal, they're not really making all that much money either. They love what they do. It's the reason they get up in the morning. They are laser focused on their goal. They cannot imagine doing anything else at all. And the second thing is they have this strong level of perseverance. So if there is a challenge, they are going to do whatever it takes to overcome that challenge. Because again, going back to the intrinsic motivation, this is what they were born to do. 
So they know it's a long road and they know that there are bumps and barriers and hurdles and craters along the way. But the way they view a challenge is different than most people. They're not going to whine and say, oh, poor me. Oh, poor me, I didn't get a grant. Oh, poor me, I was rejected for a promotion. Or poor me, there's a pandemic and I'm stuck at home. They don't ever say that. They say, here's the challenge. They don't question if they will overcome the challenge because they have the self-confidence and the self-efficacy that they will overcome that challenge. Instead, where they focus their mindset on is how to overcome that challenge. They completely shift their thinking. It's not if, it's how. So they focus all of their energy, that laser focus we talked about, on how to overcome the challenge. And they work at it and work at it and work at it. And you hear this from the Nobel laureates who are up doing their research at all hours to the Olympians who are constantly practicing, even if when they didn't get to meet their initial goal, because they know they're going to, to hit that goal eventually. And they're not afraid of failure. They know it's part of the process. So if we talk about, for example, the former chief astronaut of the United States, Dr. Peg Whitson, she had to apply for 10 years before she was ever accepted as an astronaut at NASA, 10 years. Eventually she became the chief astronaut of the United States, the first female commander of the International Space Station. And she has spent more days in space than any American astronaut of any gender. But she was rejected the first time she applied and the second time she applied. And this process of rejection and reapplying went on for 10 years. She knew she was going to be an astronaut. She could not see herself doing anything else. So she kept applying. She had that perseverance to keep on trying. By the way, most of the astronauts, except for one who I interviewed, had to reapply multiple times. And we also know um, there's a famous story of, of one of the recent Nobel laureates he got the call that he won the Nobel, and a few hours later, he was back at his desk applying for a government grant because he knew that just because the Nobel came, he was not going to get this influx of finances in order to uh, support his research. So he kept doing those things. He knew he'd have to. Now, the third thing that all high achievers do is that they have a very strong foundation that they are constantly reinforcing. It worked for them early on in their career and they are still doing it now. So for example, Bonnie Blair, who uh, for those of you who um, are Olympic junkies like me, she was the uh, uh, speed skater in the Winter Olympics and I think she won five gold medals. And at that point we had an East and West Germany and the East Germans were first and second. And she wanted to reach the top of that podium. She wanted to be first, but she knew that the East Germans were unstoppable. And she said that their legs were like tree trunks. And she said, I could work out all day, all night. I will never have that power. I will never have that power. She went back to the training she did early on when she first started skating, she even brought back her original coach in order to fine tune her foundation. She said, I don't have the power, but I will have a better technique. And that's how I'm going to win. And that is how she won five medals, five gold medals. And this is the same story. It doesn't matter who you ask Kobe Bryant, the late Kobe Bryant, we heard that he was in the gym before the sun rose. And he was doing the same skills you would see in any junior high gym. The, the scientists, they are still doing the same thing. The most successful scientists, they're still designing experiments. They're still writing their papers. And they do that. They're still applying for grants because those foundational skills that work for them early on are the same ones that they do later on as well. Now, the last one is that the high achievers are constantly and continuously learning. Now we have all heard of Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and Mark Cuban who read for three to eight hours a day. For those of us mere mortals who don't have three to eight hours a day to read, the point is not that they are reading so much every day, 
the point is that they are consuming new knowledge. They don't say, I know it all. They are consuming new knowledge. That is the key point. So what are some of the other ways that we can continuously learn if we don't have the three to eight hours a day or if reading is not for you? So you might choose to read and you might choose to read books. You might choose to read articles. You might choose to read blogs. You might prefer to listen to podcasts, to webinars, to lectures such as this one. You might even hear um, something on Clubhouse or watch YouTube videos or talk to people in the hallway. So all of the high achievers had mentors and not just one mentor, they had a whole team of mentors. Because again, remember, they know that they don't have all the answers and they surround themselves with people who can offer different perspectives and different ideas and different things to think about because they're always trying to get better. And these mentors believe in them more than they believe in themselves. So they help them with their career, but they also help them with the psychosocial support to be their cheerleader, to help them out when things don't work out and they're feeling a little down in the dumps. So the mentors are there to really help them. Doesn't matter how successful you are, all of them still have those mentors all around them. They're continuously learning, continuously open to learning. One of the things when I ask, for example, the physician scientists, they love going to the conferences because there's always something new for them to learn. They love that. It's, it's an intense few days of constantly learning. So that is something, and I always ask people, what is, what is your favorite? And I, I tell people, I read 70 to 100 books a year. I love reading, but I'm also an extrovert at 95%. I've been tested many times for this, 95% extrovert. I need to talk to people. That's how I learn. That's how I learn to talk through challenges, talk through ideas and see where my blind spots are because other people can share that. So one of the things you wanna do is think about the different ways that you can constantly be learning. So what are those four things again that you need to remember and, in order, and to do in order for you to have and, and to improve um, your achievement and to become a high achiever. So remember the first one is your intrinsic motivation. What would you do for free if you could? The second one is that you have this level of perseverance and you're able to get into a state of flow. It's not even work for you. You love doing it. You love doing it. And we've all heard the stories of, of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg who worked until the wee hours of the night. I actually spoke to several of her former clerks and they would tell me they would get voicemails from her at three o'clock in the morning. She didn't have to work at three o'clock in the morning. She wanted to, she loved it. So remember to have that perseverance and, and it's the way that you're looking at challenges. The third one is to have that strong foundation that you're constantly reinforcing. Go back to those basic skills that worked for you. Do not rest on your laurels. And the last and final one is to constantly learn new things and put yourself in situations where you can constantly learn new things. And that could be by reading, that could be by talking to people and definitely surrounding yourself with mentors. And I tell people all the time, if Olympic champions, even Michael Phelps, the most decorated Olympian of all times, surrounded himself with coaches and mentors, why do you think you don't need one? He got to be the best and all of these people got to be the best at what they do is because they recognize they don't know everything and they surrounded themselves with people who can offer these perspectives and ideas and nuggets to think about. So I really hope that's helpful. And I am really excited to take some of the questions um, from everyone. And again, here is my contact information for those people who maybe want to let this marinate a little bit and, and reach out a little bit later. I'd be happy to chat with you guys. So thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. I, I have a couple of questions. You know, you have studied some pretty impressive people, but we didn't really talk about where they were in you know the points of their life when you met them you know so how mm -hmm. early can people begin to foster the the peak performance skill set 
So when I met them, they were already extreme high achievers. They've already been to space. They already won the Nobel. They won the Olympic medals. That's when I've already met them. And one of the things I would tell them is I'm not interested in what I can Google about you. I want to know about everything below the waterline, below the tip of the iceberg, because that's what it took to be successful. And the stories are similar, right? It's, it's not the fact that they, they had two parents, they didn't have two parents, they came from means, they didn't come from means. There was that intrinsic motivation within them to do more, achieve more. And for them, it was never about the Nobel or the NBA championship or the going to space. There was always something bigger for them, which is why they did not crash and burn after they reached that goal, which you often hear about high achievers. For them, getting the Nobel or getting the Olympic gold medal was a goal. It was a chapter in their lives. It was not the entire story. So it's really fascinating, especially with the Olympians. I always say, okay, show me your Olympic medals. And they show it to me and I said, well, which is your favorite? And I'm stunned because very often it's not the gold. It's something that came before them because they were such valuable lessons that they found in that. Now, most of the Olympians, except for two, two had their medals on display. The others did not have it on display. One had it in a box under the bed. One had it in a safe. One had it in a brown paper bag in a sock drawer, which I thought was hysterical. And one actually gave them all away. He said it was too suffocating. I, I can't handle that. So there was something about them really early on in their lives. And some of them were really sick as children, really came from humble beginnings. But there was that fire in, in, their, in their belly that they wanted to do more. They didn't always know what that more would be, but they knew that they wanted to do more. I have a, a friend who's a very successful coach who, who says that the best athletes and the best competitors are the ones who have not just a high IQ, but who have also a very high EQ. So yeah. that you know, they, they understand all the trials and, and, and tribulations. Have, have you found that as well? Yes, they have an enormous self-awareness as well. And I think it is that self-awareness that has allowed them to reach out. And if you look at all of these really successful people, I was stunned at how humble they were. And in their, in their being so humble, it was they recognize that they don't have all of the answers. And I think that is what has made them so great. It was this enormous self-awareness in themselves and an awareness of others as well and how they were interacting. And I would ask them, I said, what are some of your favorite failures? And they would talk about their failures with more gusto and energy than they talked about their successes. They almost didn't even want to talk about their success. It was those, those bumps in the road, those failures that really were the greatest learning points for them. It's fascinating. Ruth, thank you so much for your time.